Good morning and welcome to worship for this 15th day of September 2024. This is the 17th Sunday after Pentecost. Thank you for joining us, the people of St. Stephen, where we are rooted in our tradition and open to yours. We begin this morning with confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives all of our sin, whose mercy for us endures forever. Amen. Join together this morning, let us confess our sin, and by the calling of the Holy Spirit, come together before God for healing. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have honored you with our lips, but have harmed our neighbors with our tongues. The cravings at war within us cause conflicts and they cause disputes. In our desire to be first, we make distinctions among ourselves. We place the needs of the poor and of the suffering last. So in your great mercy, forgive us our sins. Draw near to us with grace in time of need, and allow us to follow in the way of Jesus Christ, who is our Savior and our Lord. Amen. Child of God, God promises to forgive your iniquity and to remember your sin no more. By grace, through Christ Jesus, you have been saved. We're called together this morning by the Holy Spirit, and it is in the name of Jesus Christ, who is the source of your eternal healing, that your sins are forgiven. Amen. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the eighth chapter. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed. And after three days, rise again. And he said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The Gospel of the Lord. So, once upon a time, there was an airplane with a pilot and a co-pilot and four passengers aboard. It was a small, private airplane on a pretty long flight. 
and they were pretty far into it and they were essentially in the middle of nowhere when the cabin door burst open and the co-pilot flew into the passenger area and in absolute rage completely worked up 100 percent freaked out and he said that the plane was doomed and it was going down they had a little bit of time but not a lot and this was a disaster the plane is going down the plane is going down and uh, he said that's not even the worst part there's six of us two pilots four passengers six people there's six of us and we've only got five parachutes and uh, this pilot and co-pilot were maybe the most unchivalrous the most uh, ethically uh, challenged pilot and co-pilot of all time and they had a head start they took two of the, pa the parachutes and immediately jumped out which leaves us with four people and three parachutes right and so after the shock of this the first person to pull herself together and put any semblance of a discussion together was a woman who said, I am a brain surgeon. A lot has been invested in me, uh, but I really just kind of get into the peak of my career. I have a lot to offer the world. And uh, if I jump out and I'm saved, uh, a lot of other people will be saved too uh, with some severe problems that I know how to fix. And the rest of the passengers were like, yeah, you should have a parachute. So we're down to three people and two parachutes. The next guy to talk uh, said that uh, he was, uh, hey, look, I, I am uh, the smartest guy on this plane. Uh, even when the brain surgeon was in here, I was the smartest. He said, I might be the smartest guy in the whole world. He said, I am a researcher. My research matters. And without it, uh, some positive change isn't going to happen. And so he took a parachute and he jumped out which leaves us with two people and one parachute. The last two people were a kid and a Lutheran pastor. And the Lutheran pastor uh, was a well-established guy who had been in his ministry for a long time, and he knew what was up. And so he looked at the kid and he said, hey, I'm old. Uh, I've lived a, a lot. I've shared the gospel. Uh, I know what it means to carry your cross. Uh, uh, you're a kid with a long life ahead of you it's okay, go ahead and take the parachute. To which the kid looked at him and responded, uh, you know, I, I, I don't think you need to worry about all that. He said, I don't think it, uh, it's gonna come to that. He said, uh, there's two of us and there's still two parachutes left. Uh, the smartest guy in the world uh, a minute ago, uh, he jumped out with my backpack. Oh, have you ever uh, noticed this in real time? How smart people are, how smart we can tell other people that we are or think to ourselves that we are. Ever notice how smart people are these days? Because if you've noticed that, how our intelligence works and, and how uh, this joke moves, then you might have ears to hear it. That our intelligence, no matter how good we are at uh, advertising it, is not foolproof that we can't know everything and sometimes mistakes are made. Uh, earlier this week, uh, I went to uh, one of my sons who is bigger than I am and who is more fit than I am and who is stronger than I am. And I said to him, uh, I'll give you a dollar if you can lift me up. I'm smaller than he is and he kind of laughed about this and uh, the challenge accepted. Uh, he got behind me, I put my arms to my side, I said, use my elbows and let's just see if you can do it. And so he lifted me up into the air by my elbows and uh, he had earned an easy dollar and sort of bragging rights. And I said, uh, how about five dollars if you can do it again? And at that point I just moved my arms forward a little bit and asked him to lift me uh, the same way, to use my elbows to lift me. And he got behind me and he tried and I did not leave the floor and I couldn't leave the floor no matter how much he tried all because of that little imperceptible uh, change to gravity. And I'm wondering if you've ever noticed this. I'm wondering if you've ever noticed how strong or capable or able-bodied people feel like they are these days. If you have ears to hear this or eyes to see it, maybe you can hear in that story that our strength isn't as universal as we think it is and as we want other people to think that it is. Maybe we're not as smart and maybe we're not as strong 
and maybe we're not as put together as we're all the time feeling like we need to tell people we are. Uh, a week or two ago, uh, I was uh, uh, milling around in an event that I was at and uh, got into talking to the person next to me. They uh, came up to me, they engaged me in the conversation. It's not a, it's, we're people that have been at this sort of similar event uh, multiple times, but have never spoken. And this person engaged me after all these years of it. And uh, um, the, as we talked, uh, and as I said some things, it led the person to ask uh, what I did. And I shared with them that, like the guy in the joke, I was a Lutheran pastor, and I'm old, and I've been doing this a while, and you know, that sort of thing. And uh, at which point, uh, the person uh, moved into a different uh, sort of tone, a different sort of way of speaking, and they looked at me and said that they uh, no longer uh, go to their church, but that they see themselves as a good person, that they know the Ten Commandments and they know about prayer, and they're able to do these things. And as we talked, what they talked about was that they're just uh, sometimes kind of alone. And I'm wondering if you've ever noticed this. I'm wondering uh, if you've noticed how good and capable all of us are in being religious and following the commandments and being good people. And I'm wondering if you have ears to hear and eyes to see and hands to feel what this is about. That our goodness isn't always good enough. Here's a person who no longer goes to church but is talking about uh, being isolated and alone, but their ability to follow the Ten Commandments on their own. And I can easily say that, you know, maybe a church would be able to help you with uh, at least one of these problems, right? Jesus said, if any wish to come after me, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. He said, for those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will save it. But have you ever noticed how smart we are? How strong we are? How religious we are? And that even though our uh, knowledge isn't foolproof, and even though our strength isn't universal, and even though our goodness isn't always good enough, have you ever noticed how uh, we're so good at telling people I'm wondering if you can hear this. I'm wondering if anybody has ever seen in us the encapsulating idea of what Jesus is actually talking about here with taking up his cross. Have you ever felt like you've been a cross bearer? And do you think anybody's ever seen it or felt it in us? My sense is that you and I and most everybody that we know have heard this text about carrying our own cross, that if we want to follow this great uh, person, this God in our midst, that we would take up our cross and be like him. And my sense is, is that we think we're smart enough, and we think we're strong enough, and we think we're religious enough to carry our cross. We're faithful people, we're smart about that, we have a strength in our faith, we're religious about our faith, and so we think that our cross is this thing that we've come to believe, or come to know, or come to have strength from, or come to be religious about, and that we carry that cross, and we think that what it means to carry a cross is to maybe be sometimes belittled, or sometimes not liked because of our smarts, our strength, religious self. But I'm here to ask you this morning if you can hear it, if you can see it, and if you can feel it. That cross-bearing really has nothing to do with intelligence or strength or goodness, all of which aren't foolproof, aren't universal, and which aren't always good enough. I'm wondering if we can hear this, that picking up our own cross is a challenge to a certain way of discipleship and life and a certain way of being. In the Gospel of Mark, uh, in a text or in a bit of an account that we're not to yet, but we will be to uh, eventually, uh, we hear the story of Jesus taking up his cross. How familiar with that story are you? Do you remember that he's taken up his cross after a severe, physical, real beating? 
remember that he uh, took up his cross after a really trying, uh, in the midst of that beating, sort of philosophical discussion with some really important uh, religious and political leaders. Do you remember that he took up that cross? So this is the cross that he's talking about in our gospel text today from the middle, uh, eighth chapter of Mark. Do you remember that story? Because if you remember it, you remember that even Jesus himself could not and did not carry the cross alone. And I'm wondering if this is a bit of what we're being steered into. People that think that we're smart. People that think that we are independent and strong and that we're even religious. Why else would we uh, tune into this together, right? Other than our faith and goodness and our religion. But I'm wondering if that's... Uh, the same as uh, hearing that any that wish to come after Jesus deny themselves and take up their cross to follow him. Jesus uh, did not carry the cross all by himself. This morning's uh, talk of Jesus the Messiah speaking to the people in Mark is the first of three predictions of his passion. And each time he makes that prediction, the audience, whoever it would be, in this case it's Peter, don't want this to be what's in store for Jesus. Because what he's talking about is not uh, intelligent, and it's not strong, and it's not even particularly religious. It's a challenge. And it's uh, about brokenness. And it's about his uh, physical body uh, being placed in a position that no one would really think or, or, or dream that it ever would be. We live in a world where we think we're smart enough, or we think we're strong enough, and where we think we are religious enough. But if you have ears to hear, eyes to see, and hands to feel this, you'll hear just what it means for Jesus to say, for any that wish to come after him would have to deny themselves and take up their cross. And they would know that the story of Jesus carrying his cross is not a thing that he did by himself, but a thing that he did nonetheless. My sense of uh, our understanding of the cross is that it's completely skewed and that we don't uh, have this put together uh, the way that it really is. And we do this because it protects ourselves and because a cross is a scary thing. We uh, turn our crosses uh, into uh, decoration in our holy rooms. Uh, we wear them around our neck. Uh, we have them up on our walls, and we are essentially good people. And I won't deny that. But I'll also say that that might not be the same as carrying our cross. My sense of the cross is that it probably didn't look anything like the fun jewelry that we wear. That Jesus was, after he was beaten, uh, set with a beam across his hands and that they probably didn't have this tall part and that he carried this beam and it probably didn't look like we th think and it probably didn't smell or feel or sound like we think either. And my point there is is that uh, the cross as we've made it and the cross as Jesus is talking about it are probably two separate things. And I'm wondering if we are the ones who have ears to hear it, that our lives if they're to be lives that are going to be baptismal, drowned to who we think we are, and risen out of those waters to who God makes us, the kind of lives with ears that hear it. If any wish to come after me, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me keeping in mind that the cross may not look like we always think, and uh, it's not about being smart or strong or religious, and keeping in mind that Jesus himself did not carry his cross in this vacuum of his own power. Uh, maybe we begin to hear what this is asking of us. In order to hear, in order to see, in order to feel the reality of who Jesus is and this idea of following one who would carry a cross, we need to think about it. We need to hear this as a call to deny the self that believes that spirituality or religion is a suffering avoidance program. That's what we think it is. If we're just good enough, we'll avoid suffering. 
at least to some degree. And this is the self we're being asked to deny. That maybe even uh, going to the place where suffering is, is what it means to carry a cross. Maybe it's denying the self that creates a list of demands or workout routines because we believe that those and our strength will save us. Maybe our cross is denying the self that is so turned in on itself that it cannot see beyond itself and tell the parachutes of the world around us from the knapsacks. Maybe it's about this uh, denial of what we think and grasping of what we are. You and I are asked to follow in Jesus' footsteps as a thing that we could only ever do in fear and prayerfulness of a God who pronounces out of the end of all this uh, love for us. What we're being asked to think about today is denying the self that says horrible things about ourselves but tells everybody how strong, uh, smart, and religious we are. We're asking ourselves whether we can deny the self that says so many or thinks so many bad things about uh, all those other people around us uh, based on where they work or uh, what gender they are or what color they are or maybe even what sexuality they are. Are we able uh, to deny the self that pretends that we would never be the ones who need help? Can you hear this? Can you see this? Can you feel what it would really mean to carry a cross? To deny the self that buys, that gets, that achieves, that knows, that is strong and smart and religious. Deny the self being the cross here. God is your salvation. God is love and Christ is for you. And this Christ that is for us said, if any wish to come after him, that we would need to deny ourselves and take up our cross and then have a chance to follow him. It's uh, not uh, about our ability to be smart or tell people that we're smart, because we know that that's not universal, and that's the cross. It's not about our strength or our ability to tell people we're strong, because we know that that's not foolproof. It's not about uh, our religious uh, goodness, because uh, we kind of all know that we're not good enough. But it is, it is about something other than self and me, myself, and I. The cross is inquisitive and listening instead of knowing everything. The cross is humble instead of strong and independent. The cross is faithful and it's communal instead of religious and self-important. Even Jesus Christ himself did not carry the cross without help. He didn't have to, and neither do you. Do you see it? Do you hear it? Can you feel it? That to saddle you with a cross is to set you into the hands of God and God's kingdom and God's plan for you. It's to save you and to save me primarily and first of all, from ourselves. God has already provided the love and the creation and the salvation that we need, and God has provided this in Christ Jesus. The Jesus who says that if any would be able to come after him, let them deny themselves and take up their cross. The crosses of our lives are the things that are the great focuses. They're the things that help us remember that our intelligence isn't foolproof, but that it wouldn't need to be, because we have faith in this God. They're the uh, things that show us that strength isn't universal, but that that's okay, because there are other people around who can help us carry things when the time comes. 
the, the ways that we're shown that goodness is never good enough and that that's okay because God's goodness is enough for us all. Jesus said, if any wish to come after him, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow him. He said that those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for his sake will save it. Can you hear that? Is it seen in us and in the world around us? Is it felt that the cross is listening instead of knowing everything? That the cross is humility instead of strength and independence? That the cross is faith and community instead of religious self-importance? These are the things through which God works. These are the things through which Jesus is for us. Can you hear that? It's possible for you to see it. And these are yours that can be felt. If any wish to come after me, let them begin by denying themselves. Let us pray. Loving God, merciful God, it is through suffering and rejection that you come to us, that you embrace us, that you lift us, that you bring forth our salvation. By the glory of the cross, you transform our lives. And so we come before you this morning, pleading, filled with the Holy Spirit, asking that you would grant for the sake of the gospel, that we would turn from the lure of evil, that we would take up our cross, and that you would send your Spirit to lead us into following your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Thanks for joining us here at St. Stephen. These are certainly anxious days and anxious times in our life. And my hope is, is that you would know that Jesus is for you and Jesus' resurrection is ours. Stay safe. I'll see you soon.